All right, we're going to start the last panel. If you guys could uh, quiet down and, and give your attention to Rangita. She's going to introduce the, the speakers for the panel. So in every generation, there comes a call to action. And at Penn Law and with the Journal of International Law, the call to action is women's decision making, which Secretary Clinton has called the unfinished business of the 21st century. Despite a confluence of international human rights conventions, Security Council resolutions, global compacts, development goals, the numbers are dire. In 2014, women in parliament stood at a little over 21%. And if those numbers are poor, the numbers of women in peacekeeping are even more dire. We talked about this earlier in the morning, but we didn't really capture the numbers. But less than 2.2% women have been signatories to peace treaties. Less than 7% of women constitute peace delegations. And not in the history of the United Nations has there been a single woman who has headed a peace negotiation process. So what this shows is that the corridors of power are predominantly male. And men get to define what constitutes peace, what constitutes security, what constitutes transitional justice, what constitutes democracy, constitutional making, and legal system reform. Of the 37 countries that have reached or exceeded 30% women in parliament, and 30% women is considered the critical mass, the critical mass that's needed for change. So we spoke earlier about symbolic representation of women, the symbolic representation of women in parliaments, in boardrooms, in classrooms, in positions of power. But what social science research has shown is that there's not going to be a difference unless there is a 30% representation of any given one gender. So of the 37 countries that have reached or exceeded 30% women, 23 of those countries have used some kind of a quota to bring women to positions of power. So what I want to do is to engage our distinguished panelists today. And they really represent the, um, the panoramic sweep of women's leadership and decision making. Jen Klein is a special advisor to, to Hillary Clinton, who, as we all know, is running for president. Julian Pillar is, and I'm delighted, because one of the motivation factors was to have a male member on every panel. <laughs> because as we reminded ourselves earlier in the day, Women's security is human security, it's national security. So Julian Pillow is the chief of staff to Fumzili, who is the undersecretary at the United Nations and the head of UN Women, the largest multilateral organization working on women's issues globally. And Stephanie Foster is the special advisor to the ambassador, the State Department's ambassador on global women's issues. So I think these three voices really span the array of the richness of the engagement and the initiatives that are being taken around the world and here in the United States to bring women to positions of power to have equal numbers of women in decision making. So some of the questions, the areas of inquiry that I want each of you to engage in is what difference does difference make? What difference? do women make when they are at the table? So we call for more women, but, and we have some data about the difference that women make. The most recent data comes out of the Global McKinsey Report that was released just two months ago that says if women have equal access to men to the marketplace, that that will provide $28 trillion to the global GDP by 2025. 
but there isn't really data done on what difference, both economic, social, and political, that women in positions of power in parliaments and in other uh, uh, decision-making positions really make. And I'm talking of, I'm not talking, I know that there is, we, we have anecdotal evidence. We know the stories, the narrative that women say. But I also want there to be a greater engagement in the data collection on what difference difference makes. Secondly, I want to, uh, I want you to engage in, when women are not at the table, how is the policy agenda impoverished? What is the missing link? And what is the paucity of evidence-based research that prevails when women are not at the table? Second, what, how can men and male alliances contribute to women's decision-making and in bolstering women's decision-making and women's leadership? Then finally, a rather polemical question is the difference between what, I, what is called substantive representation or symbolic representation. You know, Judge Gertner raised it earlier, you know, do numbers matter? Is it about numbers, the numbers of women, or is it about substantive representation? Not every woman at the table is going to advance a gender agenda. Now, is that necessary? Is that necessary? Are we just talking of symbolic representation? Having a woman in power, Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, they were not feminist leaders. But having them there in positions of power, did they change the image of power? And was that alone enough? Or do we want to dig deeper? Do we want substantive representation? Do we want women? And it doesn't matter the numbers. It doesn't have to be 30% women. Even if we have a woman who is going to push the frontiers for all women, how does that make a difference? And how does it compare with, the, uh, with symbolic representation? And then going back to men, men sometimes, and most times, as we know from this symposium, advance women's issues. In a recent study that I supported uh, when I was at the Wilson Center on parliamentary representation in Uganda showed that there were more gender-friendly bills passed before the quota was implemented than after the quota was implemented. And that the men were, it was when it was a male-dominated parliament that the bill on violence against women was passed. But what it also showed was a very complex picture that when women came on board, they managed to push through the equal inheritance law, which was stuck in parliament. Because that was opposed by men, because that threatened men's economic security. You know, male parliamentarians didn't think of violence against women as threatening because these were obviously upper class men and were more um, favorable towards a bill like that. But when it came to property rights, there was a greater hostility and resistance. So these are very complex. I don't think there are simple answers to this. So I want you to engage with some of these ideas and issues that I have thrown out. And I'm going to give each one of you five minutes to uh, ponder on some of those questions uh, through the prism and the lenses of your work. Starting with you. OK. Great. First, I want to thank you, Rangita, for um, asking me to be here. I also am a graduate of Penn Law School. And I was on the predecessor journal to the Journal of International Law myself. I was the executive editor. So, and this used to be the Biddle Law Library. So um, that's how long ago I was here. But it's nice to be back here. And thanks to all of you for being here. And thanks to uh, Nick and Ben for uh, being uh, the drivers here of this uh, really great event. I uh, have worked, as you can see in my bio, bio um, in a, a wide range of issues. And I, I only say that to say I think there are linkages between all of the issues we've talked about today. Uh, the issues about women's political participation and participation in decision making obviously have an impact on uh, laws about women in the economy, uh, laws about gender-based violence, laws about inheritance, uh, laws about everything. And so uh, the issues are inextricably interlinked and critically important. I want to step back one minute because in my job I work on a wide range of issues including political participation, economic participation, and this, the rubric of women, peace, and security. 
I say that because this participation issue is integral to mm -hmm. our Women, Peace, and Security framework, uh, which was promulgated first with UN Security Council Resolution 1325 uh, to the most recent uh, Security Council Resolution 2422 last two weeks ago. Uh, but there are three really main efforts to really create a stronger, more stable world through the inclusion of women. And we think about it at the U.S. State Department and I think internationally in three big buckets. And that is we need to think about the protection of women and, and children uh, and other uh, victims of violence. We need to ensure that violence is prevented. And we need to make sure that everyone, especially women, get to participate in the decisions that are made about their futures. Uh, we know that women, as noted before by other speakers, have uh, negotiated peace, uh, peace accords at lower and local levels. Uh, there's also been, have been women who have been engaged in peace agreements uh, around the world, though not at very large numbers. I should note that uh, the Mindanao Peace Agreement mm -hmm. in the Philippines uh, was remarkable because the government team of six had three women, um, and they were very uh, successful in that effort, along with their counterparts uh, in the Mindanao Islamic Liberation Front, uh, in actually coming to a peace accord after 15 years of, of uh, struggle and battle. So uh, there are women out there, but there aren't enough of them. Um, this is also an important topic in general because in 2015 there are 70 elections alone around the world uh, where we look at uh, decisions being made by citizens on everyone from who's going to be in their parliament to their local council to be their president. And so we need to think about uh, this and take a special look, I think, right now. The one other major thing I'll say before I answer some of Rangita's questions are that I think we shouldn't just limit ourselves to thinking about women um, in political, uh, sort of elected and appointed office. Though that's where we tend to go when we have this conversation. Obviously, women in the judiciary are very important. They're very big players in um, the way that we uh, make decisions in our branch, in our uh, legislative and judicial branches. But we also need to look internally. And so in the US government, for example, just some interesting facts, about 30% of senior US State Department officials are women. Um, and we do have very impressive numbers at the top right now of the State Department. Um, but I think in general, 30% of senior officials are women, and 35% of USAID mission directors are women. About 17% of active duty military officers are women in the United States military. So those are the numbers in another set of very, very important institutions. And we could look at those numbers all across government. But I think we need to look as we're having this, this discussion about women in decision making at every level and in every institution in the public and private spheres. So I'm only going to touch on a couple of these points because I know I have great colleagues um, in this panel. I want to talk a little bit about Rangita's sort of last question, which is this issue of are numbers alone enough or are we looking at substantive, uh, sort of substantive representation as well? And I actually think the answer is they're both really important. Um, I think that's a little bit controversial. This is obviously my personal opinion. Many people would say that numbers alone are enough. And then there are people who would say, no, numbers alone aren't enough. And in fact, numbers don't matter that much. What matters is who's in office and if they take a more uh, sort of feminist or stronger stand on issues that are important to women and, and sort of take the stands that we would collectively view, I think, as being women's issues or women's perspectives. I, I think both are really important, and here's why. I think that role models matter. I worked, I should say, also for two US senators, one woman and one man. And the woman I worked for, Barbara Mikulski, um, was the first Democratic woman elected to the US Senate in her own right, meaning she did not follow a husband who died. <laughs> Um, a brother, a father, all of whom died in, in earlier iterations. And, you know, rising to be the, the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Um, she obviously was an advocate for women, but I think is also well known in her career for being an advocate for her state, the state of Maryland, spending on science and technology, um, and really being clear about the importance of innovation to our future economic gain. Um, so one person makes a difference. Um, I think she's also a role model for other women who come after her. I think women like Margaret Thatcher do make a difference. I may not agree with Margaret Thatcher. I am sure I would not have wanted her to be 
the prime minister of my country if I'd been a British citizen at the time, but I think it was important. I think it shows everyone that women can be there, and I don't think we should pigeonhole women into being one ideology or another because we're people too, right? Women are people too. And I think that it, it's reflective of the fact that we, uh, from my perspective, need women to be engaged in every decision it, at every level, in every place, in every political party, in every table that a decision is being made, so that we have the perspective of women everywhere. At the same time, obviously, I think that we want women and hope that women will carry the issues that, that we tend to see as women's issues. And the studies do tend to bear that out, uh, studies in the globally, but also studies here in the United States, that women do tend to focus on issues uh, that we see as more uh, family and women's issues. Um, I think that's changing, though, and I think the studies need to be updated. There's another research project mm -hmm. for people. Because I think, as we see now, women are, women elected officials are in many, many different committees and many, many different places have, with interests in many, many different issues, depending on their personal interests, the, the people they represent, or where they're assigned in terms of, uh, especially in a government that assigns people to ministries, not necessarily based on, um, you know, the issue that they've worked on in the past. So I think we need to start looking at that. I mean, is that still the case? Um, but I think it's, it's important to have both, to really look at the numbers so that women from every perspective and can really look at people and see uh, someone who looks like them being engaged in, in public policy. But I also think we need to, as uh, sort of outside advocates, as citizens, as voters in our countries, to really make the case in general to our elected officials, whoever they are, men or women, that the issues that we care about matter. And I think that goes to the issue of uh, male champions and knowing that uh, there can be, I, Chris Dodd, who I worked for, was an incredible advocate for uh, family leave. And um, he was actually the person who's been given the most credit for moving the, the family and medical leave bill in the US Senate um, when he was in the Senate. And so I think we can have male champions as well as female champions, and part of that is as voters and as citizens creating an environment where people understand that, it, that addressing the issues that we have heretofore seen as women's issues are really addressing issues that are all of our issues. Every issue is a women's issue, I think, and every issue is a man's issue, and it all goes to ensuring that we can fully participate in our societies and that we can have public policy that reflects the most diverse set of opinions possible. So with that, I'm going to stop and turn it over to my other panelists, and I know we'll have more time for questions. So thank you very much, and it's great to be back at Penn Law School. Thank you, Stephanie. So <coughs> apart from the... <laughs> thank you. It's that Penn Law thing. You've been nice to me. So apart from the full participation model that you <coughs> articulated, I think you also showed that women's decision-making and women being at the table has impact. I think that's what is important to make a business case in order to ensure that women are present in numbers. And the business case model also shows that women's participation and women's decision making impacts not just women, as you said, the communities, but men. It has a transformative impact on men. And you know now the well-known Poverty Lab report done by Esther Dufflow shows that women's participation uh, in the panchayat or the local government has a transformative impact mm -hmm. on the fathers. Fathers tend to keep and retain their daughters longer in school because they see more possibilities for their daughters and for their daughters because they see women in positions of leadership and women in positions of decision making. So this has this kind of unanticipated, unrelated mm -hmm. impact in different ways that is difficult to quantify, but also shows the impact that women make. But I think what I'm also trying to <coughs> gather and gain through this conversation is can we make a case that when women are not at the table, certain issues are not focused upon, that certain issues do not get the kind of uh, privileged focus that would, that that would be if a woman was at the table. And I think when you study the peace treaties, what you see is that the peace treaties that were negotiated by women have <coughs> right to water, have right to education, have right to sanitation, have a call for 
um, uh, freedom from violence in greater degree, in greater focus than those tre peace treaties that were negotiated by men only. So I think it's a way of showing what ha what difference difference makes. Mm -hmm. So with that, Jen, it's a perfect segue because that is one of the things that I was going to mention. So thank you, Brangita, and thank you to you all for, for being here and for having this incredible conference. Um, and I want to say, Nancy, that I'm wearing a blue leather jacket. And I didn't know if I fell into the old category or the young <laughs> category, but I thought I'd point that out right now. <laughs> um, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the data um, that shows what difference women make. And, and as everybody knows, I've uh, worked for Secretary Clinton for many years, since 1993, um, working on domestic issues in the White House, but, but more recently working with her on international issues. And one of the things that we, um, that she and I helped uh, her with at the State Department was um, <laughs> looking at that evidence base to really make the case of what difference women make and also what difference um, men make. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we have more data than ever that confirms what we've always known intuitively that when women and girls have the opportunity to participate, economies grow and nations prosper. And of course, you know, those in this room know first and foremost this is a moral issue and mm -hmm. it started with a human rights mm -hmm. argument and no one should ever lose sight mm -hmm. of that human rights argument, um, which was made long before Secretary Clinton in 1995 said the words women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. Her voice simply lifted that argument which had been made on the backs of many women advocates who'd come before her. Um, but it's also a strategic imperative. Um, so just to cite a few statistics to, to support what Rangita was, um, was asking about is, um, and some of these are, are economic and some of these are political, um, and I, that's intentional because I think participation clearly matters in all of these areas. Um, if we close the global gap in workforce participation between men and women, gross domestic product worldwide would grow by nearly 10% by 2030, including 10% right here in the United States. If women farmers had the same access to productive resources as men, agricultural output would rise and the number of hungry people in the world could be reduced by up to 150 million. Women's participation in legislatures, corporate boards, and peace negotiations can affect policy choices and make institutions more representative and inclusive. And you'll notice there the, the numbers are less clear because the data is less clear. Um, but we have, and we've, we've talked about the um, the panchayats in India, and as Rangita just mentioned, well, a, a slightly different point um, that, that has also been researched, that in women-led vi villages, there's more um, investment in infrastructure and drinking water. Um, in Rwanda, which is another great example, 64% um, of the um, parliament is um, female. Um, that, of course, is because of the tragic reason that so many men were killed in Rwanda. Um, and the population itself is 70%. Um, before the genocide, women held only 10% of parliamentary seats. So that's striking for totally other reasons. Um, but but what, is, um, what we can learn from that is that with a female-led legislature, we've seen um, laws passed that allow women to own land, that allow women to open bank accounts. Um, so again, you know, the notion that it, it actually matters. And um, back to the conversation about peace processes, again, we don't know that much because so few peace processes have involved and in fact been led by women, but we do know, based on the research that is available, that women are most like, more likely to raise issues like security, justice, and health care. And um, what is entirely clear from the evidence is that if those kinds of issues are included in peace negotiations, the peace is more sustainable and long-lasting. So, Transitioning to your, your, uh, your other question about symbolic representation versus substantive representation, I, I think I would um, entirely agree with Stephanie that, that both matter. I mean, there's, there's studies in the private sector that show that a certain number of women on boards is important to actually changing board decisions or even allowing the women who serve on the board to feel that they can adequately represent their views. You see the same thing in the political sphere internationally. Um, so, so I do think it matters to have women in numbers, um, but I also think it matters who those who those women are. Um, you know, on the on the domestic side, I'm now uh, working with Secretary Clinton on her um, 
her campaign for the presidency, and we have these endless, what seems to me, endless discussions in this country about whether she should run as a woman or whether she should run on women's issues, which I find amazing for so many reasons. Um, but of course, she is going to run for president, and, and I hope she will be president first and foremost because she's incredibly competent, as Nancy said. Really, um, you, you couldn't find somebody, in my opinion, who, um, who could do a better job. But I also think it absolutely does matter that she's a woman. And the issues that she's worked on, and I've been privileged to work on with her for so many years, are um, have been seen for many years as women's issues. And I think actually what's nice uh, in the last maybe five years is that they're seen less as women's issues and more as issues that affect everybody. So the, the, the example that I always like to point to is, is paid leave, paid family and medical leave, um, which when I worked on it with her in 1993, um, and we uh, uh, had the Family and Medical Leave Act passed, thanks, as Stephanie noted, to um, several champions in the Senate, some of them men. Um, that was entirely seen as a women's issue and that women were the people who would take leave. And the world has changed, right? So research shows that men are more, far more interested, far, far more interested in taking leave here um, than um, they were. And, um, and people see that even if they think in their own family that their wife will be more likely to be the person to take leave, that it has economic impact on the entire family. So that issue, which has been historically seen as a women's issue, is not so much seen as a women's issue. The same could be said about minimum wage um, or child care or these sort of very um, nuts and bolts economic issues. Um, so I do think that while numbers matter, um, I might edit Stephanie slightly to say numbers matter and a little bit more. Um, the person who is advocating for the issues that are important to women and their families probably matters even more. Thank you, Jennifer. And why I press for evidence-based research, about which you have worked for several years now, and that has been the No Ceilings Project, Secretary Clinton's project on collecting the data post Beijing over the last over the span of the last 20 years has been incredibly powerful and incredibly important for advocates for decision makers in making this case and why on a personal level why this is important to me is when I first came to Penn Law I had a meeting with a very well known political science professor from the political science department and who's been involved in some of the peacekeeping missions from an academic point of view and I was telling him I was sharing with him the data on the on the women in peace negotiating processes and he turned to me and he said but Rangita there is absolutely no proof that having women there would make a difference so I said how can you say that when women have been absent from the peace processes how could you do any research on the lack of women's positive contribution to these peace processes when women have been so conspicuously absent from them. And I think so that is why I at both the personal, political, intellectual, academic level, I am determined to get that data and to have first and foremost a critical number of women at the table so that we could do the research on that. Julian. Well, thank you very much, Rangita, and uh, thank you for inviting me and it's great to to, uh, well, be at the end of such an interesting day. I feel that a lot has already been said, so I'm, not going, I'm going to try not to repeat. I just wanted to pick up on uh, one point that you made in your introduction about the numbers. And uh, yes, the numbers are low. We're at 22% of women parliamentarians uh, globally, 17% um, of women ministers globally, very low numbers. But what is even worse is the progression. And uh, at UN Women, we did a global review of the implementation of the Beijing Platform for Action, uh, which is the key normative document on the, on, uh, for the promotion and the achievement of gender equality and women's empowerment. And, and we have seen that, uh, for example, for women parliamentarians, the numbers have gone from 11% to 22% only in 20 years. That's nothing. For ministers, it's even lower. Uh, it's, uh, it went from 14% to 17% today. It's extremely low. And then there are also uh, numbers where we don't e numbers that we don't even have about women in local government, women in corporate boards, in the private sector, uh, women in the judiciary. We have uh, a few numbers on that, but again, very, very low. 
so I think it's, uh, it's important to remember as well that, uh, yes, there has been increase, but too slow. And we really, really need to accelerate, I think, the sustainable development goals and the fact that there is a solid uh, gender perspective in the, in the new development goals uh, will be a, an accelerator that we should, that we should leverage for, for greater progress. Um, now, coming back to your questions, I think, you know, I completely agree with you about the importance of making the business case. But at the same time, I think we really need to interrogate that question about what are the benefits of, uh, of having the validity of that question about what are the benefits of having women at the table. Um, I hope most of you saw the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, a few uh, days ago when he was asked why it was so important for him that his cabinet be 50-50 uh, gender balance, and his answer was, because it's 2015. <laughs> and uh, to me, that's a perfect answer. I mean, I think it's really a matter of human rights. I'm sorry to be so stereotypical as the UN guy coming to talk about human rights, but I think it's really just a basic matter of human rights, and it should be a shame for uh, any government, any society, any private company um, not to understands that this is in their benefits to have a complete representation. I don't understand, I know there is a lot of um, debate around quotas and, um, and it's a controversial issue, but at the same time I'm still struck that nobody thinks it's a problem to have geographical quotas, which we call geographical representation, but that we would question gender quotas. Uh, so I, I really, and, and I'm sure that if men were put in the other position, uh, they would be very happy to have uh, a number of seats reserved for them, or at least a chance to be on the lists of the political parties where they want to, for which they want to campaign. So I think it's really important to, to, to question that and to always remind ourselves of uh, that basic um, uh, human right. Um, having said that, I also think, and I, you have, I'm not going to repeat what you said, we know that uh, having women at the table improves uh, decision making, improve political processes. It's difficult. It's difficult to collect the evidence around that because uh, I think political processes are not linear processes. Uh, it's, it, they're complex. It's difficult to see causality between uh, participation and results. So uh, it's, it's not an easy case. So I admire your uh, drive, but, <laughs> but at the same time, I think it's, it's very difficult. Um, and we know that, in any case, we know that inclusive decision making always results in better decision making. And also, I think it's particularly, and here I'm, 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 I might sound a little bit stereotypical, but I, I think it's particularly important for issues uh, that directly impact women. I was recently in Chile where President, now President Bachelet, my former boss, <laughs> uh, uh, was uh, promoting her campaign on uh, her law on abortion, which is extremely controversial all around the world, but particularly in Chile, which is one of the few countries that don't have any, uh, where abortion is illegal under any circumstances. Um, and she was saying, well, we may disagree on, uh, on abortion and, the, and whether it should be legal or not, or under which circumstances, but I think we can all agree that women should be part of this discussion. And I think that's really an important, another example that also we like to repeat in UN Women was the former, uh, again, another prime minister of Canada at this time, Kim Campbell, uh, who uh, at the time when she was minister was in a cabinet meeting that was discussing sexual, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And they were talking about something about contraception. It was not about abortion. And, you know, all, and she was the only female uh, minister. And all these men were, you know, starting to discussing about family planning, and, and she got so irritated, she said, well, let me tell you how the women's body work. And apparently she went into a very detailed explanation of uh, family planning and reproduction and what it felt <laughs> to be uh, to, to being a woman. So I think women's perspectives in any decision making are extremely important, particularly on those that affect them first. Um, I think, uh, Judge uh, Gartner, you said, the, you talked about the importance of collecting stories. And, and I think that that's, I would absolutely second that. Because I think for us men, sometimes we don't even realize uh, the experiences, the lived experiences of women. Uh, right now in Brazil, there is a campaign called Primeiro Assédio, which means first assault, uh, where it's on, it's on Twitter, where women are just in, on Twitter, so in a very few words, relating their first assault, 
and uh, and you know uh, it opened the eyes. I'm, I'm Brazilian too. I'm Swiss and Brazilian, and and it opened the eyes of many many Brazilian men who didn't even realize that these things were happening, and who didn't even realize that this was impacting women, uh, because they thought it was part of you know what guys do, and you know women kind of like it, and you know. So I know it sounds crazy, but it's it's the reality. Uh, I was once in a um, seminar where we were asked, where we were all asked. Who among you um, check if you have to walk out at night, it's late, and you check how much battery you have on your phone? And how, how, how many among you would check how, how much battery you have left on your phone before you venture into the streets late at night? And pretty much all the women put their hands up, and not a single man did. And I turned to my colleague and I said, really? You check your battery on your phone? I mean, I never even occurred to me. So I'm just, I'm just giving these experiences because I think this is part of this you know, dark side of the male brain <laughs> where we, we just because, and it's, in a way it's not our fault, we just haven't had these experiences, so it's difficult for us to, to, to relate to them. And this is why I come back to the human rights argument that women need to be at the table to be able to relay these experiences. Um, I'm not going to repeat all the great examples that you gave on um, on you know the, the different issues where women have been able to make a difference, but just one I want to say is also the ability of women to work on uh, cross-party women caucuses. Uh, that has uh, been in that has been the case in many countries, starting in the Nordic countries in the 70s already, um, and in in Rwanda, for example, where you which you explained, I think cross-party women caucuses have managed to push. Uh, laws on domestic violence, on land rights, on food security, in ways that had never been possible before. And these were not just laws that uh, impacted women, but they were laws that impacted the whole of the population, of course. So it's really important to invest in, quali in, uh, in quality and not just quantity. I mean, quotas are extremely important, but they're worth nothing if they're not accompanied by a real questioning of the structural uh, issues of the patriarchy that undermines the, 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 in the male-dominated political systems. Uh, and and I, this is why I think the examples that you bring on peace and security are so important, because that is typically the male-dominated sector. And here, uh, I think the global study on the implementation of uh, Security Council Resolution 1325 that just came out brings actually the best examples of the difference that women have been able to make uh, by being at the table. Uh, there has been a study of 40 peace processes, and they have found that there was a, a significantly higher chance that an agreement would be reached when women were able to exercise influence. Uh, there was also a significantly higher likelihood of implementation. And the main effect of women's presence uh, has been not to you know, necessarily talk about women's issues, but has been to actually push for the start mm -hmm. of negotiations, the resumption, or the finalization of, uh, of, of the negotiations. Also, they have they've done an analysis of 181 peace agreements, and they have found that uh, when women are present, there is a 20% increase of the peace agreement lasting at least two years, and over time, this increased to 35% over for 15 years of, of, of peace agreement. So these are solid evidence, there are numbers, these, these are based on data that we can use. And just one last point, if I may, um, coming back to this issue of talking, you know, sometimes we interchangeably use gender parity versus gender equality, and I think that really comes to the heart of your question about uh, symbolic representations versus substantive representation. I think it's important to always remember that we're here to strive for gender equality and not just for gender parity, that it's essential to look at these issues of structural changes and for us at UN Women, one thing that is worrying us very much uh, now is the issue of shrinking democratic spaces and how this is affecting uh, women's organizations around the world in particular. Uh, the ability for them to speak up, to be part of the processes, to have their voices heard, to have funding. And that is not only in countries like Russia and China and some countries in Africa, but actually even in the European Union, with the, in European countries with major crises that they're facing, the, the cuts for women's organizations are extremely uh, important and, and that is affecting their ability to be part of the process, to have their voices heard, and, and to be part of the decision making. 
Thank you, Julian. Um, I want to take a, a minute to invoke uh, Kim Campbell and Michelle Bachelet because you reminded us about their leadership roles in the world at the UN and in their countries. Uh, Michelle Bachelet, when she was first inaugurated as the president of Chile, was determined to change the images of power. And at her first inauguration, she made sure that the the police escorts who were escorting her to parliament were all women. So they would wear black leather jackets, bomber jackets, and on motorcycles escort this woman, the first woman president of mm -hmm. parliament. So by that stroke, that very genius inspired stroke of you know, imagery and artistic imagery, she really changed the image of power. And then once in power, she made sure that the stereotypes would be dismantled. So she had men at the reception table, so, so that you know, when foreign ministers, foreign heads of state would come to her office, it would be the men with the bouquet of flowers receiving them and seated at the reception with the vase of flowers, and then her, the negotiators with the foreign heads of state were women. So you know, have you, have you very um, strategically shift the, the, the images of power. And Kim Campbell speaks of how when she was in parliament and as a minister, one of the few women ministers, the only woman minister, all of the committee hearings were conducted from 9 to 12 in the night. And she thought to herself, that's why women cannot serve on committees because these are these ungodly hours when uh, women are not able to do so. So she asked the men, is there any reason why you can't meet at a, at a more reasonable time, you know, five to seven? And they said, no, we really didn't think of it because, you know, we are available through the day, through the night. We, and we don't have any other responsibilities. And so she made sure that committees met from three to six instead of you know, seven to 10, and then men said they had time to give care and be caregivers and better parents because of, you know, a woman's reasoning to move the timing mm -hmm. of the committees. So with that, I'm going to, I know that you're all dying to talk to our panelists and they have to leave early, all three to catch international flights to do their work globally. So questions. I'm going to take the students first. Yes. First the students. Yeah, you want to speak up here? So a lot of you mentioned a bunch of studies about the tremendous positive effect that women in government can have. And I think that's totally correct and completely improvement. But there are also studies showing that women are just just as likely to get elected as men when they actually run for president or for Congress in Western countries. The issue is that women are not running. That could be because of sexism, that could be because of just personal choice. How do you think you should encourage more women to run, and why are they not running? So I'm going to ask both of you to okay. respond to that. So I'm glad you asked that question, because one of the things as I was listening to my colleagues is uh, thinking about that issue. and. I would say, I know that Jennifer Lawless has that study and there are a lot of studies around that issue area. And I think that's true. I would say two things about it. Um, and you caveated it in Western countries, in countries where, the, where, we live in, where you live in a democracy that you are not fearful that if you run for office or even vote uh, that you're going to be subject to violence. And I want to talk a little bit about that. And uh, you live in a country where your political party is I mean, nefarious in, in keeping you off the list or keeping you uh, at the bottom of the list or deciding they're willing to pay a fine to not follow the law that says you're supposed to have a zipper list, which is man, woman, man, woman. I mean, there are a lot of countries where that's the case. Now, not the, just in the United States, obviously, this is not a perfect country either. And I, when I worked for Barbara Mikulski, she had just gotten elected because she fought the machine, right? She ran against two men in the Democratic primary. One was a governor, one was a sitting member of Congress. They were both really good guys, but she said she wanted to run and she was, you know, she was not encouraged by the party at all. And the only reason she ran was, um, or was taken seriously, was a group called Emily's List, which some of you have heard of, did a poll that showed she could win. And when she had credibility within her own party, uh, she became competitive in the primary. She eventually won the primary, won the general election, became the longest serving woman to serve. But, um, so there, you know, there are even constraints here. I think one thing that we need to talk about globally, and I was, um, a couple of days ago, 
at work talking to a woman from the Czech Republic. And we were talking, she's the deputy uh, speaker of uh, uh, the parliament in the Czech Republic, the highest ranking woman in the Czech Republic uh, political system, that it's still the case that women feel that they aren't ready to run. You know, and there are also studies that say if you ask a man and a woman similarly situated, say lawyers, graduates of the Wharton School or equivalent schools, uh, are you, you know, do you want to run for office? Do you think you're qualified? Most men, I'm sorry guys, will say yes based on the same amount of experience that a woman has. The woman will say, well, I'm not ready yet. I need to get prepared. I need to learn more. I need to do this. I need to do that. So we need to break that gap, right? We need to break that gap so that women understand they have a lot to give to the process and aren't feeling like they have to always be putting it off. Kind of like uh, when the judge was talking about picking a trust in the state's practice because it helps you balance a family and you're already making decisions that you're not faced with or confronted with in your daily life. So I think that's really important across the globe. But I will say just two other things, and I know <laughs> is that gatekeepers are important. So they're important here in political parties. They're even more important in, par in places where the parties really are extremely strong, in parliamentary systems where they run the gamut. Right here, we have a very weak system, party system. Not so in most countries, you know. They have party lists. You vote for the party. The certain percentage gets in. And I think, you know, political party machinery is run by men. And it, that's one of the biggest impediments to women ar around the world. And this emerging recognition that women who vote, just vote, mm -hmm. women who run for office, women who get elected to office, women who work in the polling place are subject to violence too. So I think um, there are a lot of other things that happen in other places that make it hard for women. But in our countries, in countries where we perceive anyway that we're, you know, we have a, a stronger rule of law, a more transparent system, there are these issues around women's confidence and um, the signals that we send to women about their worth and their ability to participate uh, in every issue that is put before them. I mean, the one last thing I'll say is women often feel, well, I could be a mayor because, you know, I could run for that because I understand the issues in my neighborhood, but I, I don't have the ability to understand or be conversant on defense issues. I might argue, having worked in the U.S. Senate, I will just say this in my personal opinion, I mean, and this is, this is actually not a negative. I'm not sure that a lot of the men who come to the U.S. Senate, when they get there, have that expertise, right? I mean, we, we, we act, expect people to develop it. I mean, it's not like people are born with it. So I think we have to be cognizant that we, we send signals to women about how prepared we need to be and that we need to know so much more that make it harder for women to actually take that step. So I just wish that men would feel that they needed to be more prepared, <laughs> right, to run for office. But I want you to respond to his question, but also in doing so, look at ways in which we can unblock those blockages that women face. Great. Um, so I would broaden your question slightly um, to encompass a couple of areas. So I think um, on, in public life and politics, we need to promote women's equal participation in some countries. Um, that means the repeal of laws that actually restrict their ability to do that or the, the social norms that prevent them from doing that. Um, and in every country, we need training and leadership models and networks. I think people really always underestimate the power of networks. And I actually met Rangita when she was working on the Women in Public Service Project, which was a brilliant project to do exactly that. Um, and you know the, the training and the networks that build that pipeline so that when there is an election, women step up and are, are ready to run. I would also say in the private sector, we also need to um, boost women's participation and representation, and that is from everything from board compensation to executive middle and low level management positions. And again, I think the issues there are similar. They're the training of the pipeline, um, the networking, you know, knowing your, who, who to go to. Um, and who to rely on, and then efforts to recruit and retain women, because I think we are doing a better job at recruiting and not such a good job at retaining still in 2015. And then I think the third piece um, that really needs to be addressed, and it's hard, I, I don't have the magic bullet of how you do it, is to address those uh, stereotypes and biases. So there's you know, explicit biases, there's implicit biases, and there's very internalized biases that you know, Stephanie referred to, the, the confidence gap. 
that continue to limit women's opportunities for leadership. Um, and there's you know, an, a growing understanding of, first of all, that they exist, um, and secondly, that they can be addressed. There's some good work at Harvard being done there, um, but I think that's the third piece which often goes unsaid. Great. Uh, Holly? Uh, Stephanie, you didn't uh, mention the word quota at all. In my uh, part of the world, in the MENA region, what has made a difference in a number of countries, including Iraq, yeah. I mean, is the quota system. How important do you think, I mean, is the quota system going to be in pushing women to get to their uh, to leadership position and get that self confidence that they are as capable, if not more capable, than their colleagues. Well, obviously, I mean, if you look at the data, the countries, a large, as Regita said, a, a huge percentage of the countries that have gone over the thirty percent threshold, which is what we all perceive of as what you need, both whether it's on a corporate board. In a you know in a parliament um, whatever have quotas so quotas are obviously tremendously important and they they really move the ball forward now and that's true across the globe I happen to be from a country we do not have quotas um, in the United States of America except in the Washington D.C. City Council which Jen may also know that you know we have a quota that two of the members are not to be from the majority party um, but so there is. It's a quota, but we, we are very, you know, we don't have quotas here, and one might argue maybe if we did, we, we would be farther along in our goal. We have 20% of uh, members of Congress are women, but quotas help. I think the que there are two questions I have about quotas, and this is from the time when I taught this issue at American University a lot on women in politics. So how long do you keep a quota in place once you have a temporary special measure, as, which is actually what we really say a quota is, it's a temporary special measure. How temporary is it? And then how do we ensure that those women who actually fill those slots aren't marginalized and that that isn't used against them? Um, how do we make sure they have the skills they need to move forward so that people don't have the ability to say, well, they're just here because they're a woman um, and use that to undercut them? So how do we ensure that any woman who is running for or elected to office has those skills? But how do we help those women with with those skills especially, so that I think we're sure that they are able to fully participate and be effective in their, um, in their participation and hope that then they decide they're gonna run for a seat that isn't a reserve seat, you know? And we have seen that in some countries where women have been the highest vote getters. Um, I mean, sometimes uh, they get pushed, try, people try to, party leaders try to push them into the reserve seats even though they've won. So I think it's complicated, but certainly the evidence is indisputable. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's that question of how long do you keep a quota in place and how do we make sure that those women are actually have the skills that they need and are representing, um, representing themselves in a way that helps them be as effective as possible. So I'm glad you brought up the, uh, the language of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, which is the Global Bill of Rights on Women, Article 7, which calls for temporary special measures so mm -hmm. that to equalize the playing field right. and to address the legacy of discrimination. So I think what we need to keep in mind is this is not a charitable act. Mm -hmm. This is to actually address and redress the the generations of discrimination that, and the legacy of discrimination that women have faced. So this is really their due. It is to bring women to a starting point equally with men. So I think the notion here in the US is somehow there's a handout, that this is a, um, a, a, a charitable act. Mm -hmm. But the understanding of the CEDAW is that this is about fairness. It's about substantive equality. This is about making sure that those barriers that women face are dismantled. So it is really about equality of impact. So um, you, you had a question, right? And then uh, Fatima. And I'll ask you to address that. So Sri Lanka has now produced the world's first female mm -hmm. prime minister. 
question. Um, I'm going to answer that question, <laughs> and then have, have Julian answer that question. So, um, yes, so we, we are, we are, Sri Lanka is the proud country to have been the home of the first mm -hmm. woman head of state. But she became the head of state because of a relationship to a male head of state who, preceded, who was assassinated. So like in other countries in South Asia, these women are heads of state or in high positions of power because of their relationship either to a husband, a father, or a member of the family. So, and that in and of itself is not a bad thing, but they did not make an effort to bring the women with them to those positions of power. They did not shatter the glass ceiling for other women. So it stopped at being this symbolic representation of power. And I say this with uh, deep uh, respect to this woman head of state, because I also happen to be her godchild. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess I don't have to answer it, <laughs> but, uh, but I just wanted to, to react a bit on the issue of quotas. Um, I think that, uh, you know, several countries who have uh, adopted quotas, they have um, uh, adopted quotas not for women, but they, the provision is for at least 30% of seats mm -hmm. to be reserved yeah. for the other gender, basically, that is underrepresented. And I think that this is a good way because in a world where you know, women will go above 70% of representation, there will be at least 30% of seats for, for men. Um, uh, so I think it's, 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 I agree with the temporary, the temporary special measures and that this is about rectifying you know, uh, centuries of, uh, of gender-based discrimination. But I think it's also important to look at it not so much just in a women's perspective, but actually in a gender perspective. Uh, also, just coming back on the earlier question about, um, you know, why are women not running? Are you, I mean, you have already answered, but I think the issue of self-confidence is very big. One that I think we shouldn't underestimate is the issue of balancing family and professional obligations. Mm -hmm. And here, uh, sorry to speak about men, but I think not enough is being done to encourage men and to, uh, in a way, force men to, to do more on their family, uh, on their family obligations uh, to also rebalance that side of the equation. So um, I, think, I think that's also an important element. Uh, in terms of your question, I think, you know, we have seen heads of state and the impact they have made, and we've heard Ms. Bachelet and the boy in, in, uh, in Chile, and you know, that's a story that also in other countries we have heard. But, um, but, but we know it's not enough. And that's why I think looking at parliaments, looking at uh, um, local governments, looking at uh, the private sector is extremely important because that's not just a one-off. There is only one head of state. But when we're talking about uh, uh, bodies, representational bodies, this is where it's, it's extremely important to invest. Um, and here again, invest not just in quantity, but invest in quality. And you have already mentioned some of these necessary investments. And just to support your point on um, the impact of family policies, um, the research also shows that, or the reality is, that the countries with the um, greatest mm -hmm. female participation are also those countries with the um, most expansive mm -hmm. family policies. They're most often the Nordic, not exclusively, but most uh, often the Nordic countries, and then there's sort of a cycle because the countries that have greater female participation in the legislatures are also the countries that are more likely to pass um, more expansive family policies. Can I just say one? Yeah, second? and I just oh. and just building on that, there is also social science data and studies to show that they're also better fathers because of those work mm -hmm. family reconciliation policies. So I think it's not only about gender equality, but also being a better parent. And the building off of temporary special measures, this is not just for women, as you said, it's both mm -hmm. for men and women. And the Kenyan constitution really um, captures that when it says that uh, there has to be a 30% quota not for women, but for any underrepresented gender. Mm -hmm. So the Kenyan constitution anticipates a time where men might be a minority. Mm -hmm. So it's really about temporary special measures that will augment the equal voices of both men and women in parliament. And, um, 
at, yes, you, the Akiko and uh, Just two more. Yes, we'll, we'll take both questions and. So, okay. um, you know this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Radita, I remember I uh, my latest book was on women's leadership, religion, and party politics, and in which I covered 26 countries. Maybe we, maybe we could add this to the list. The reading list: 26 countries and comparative perspective, and taking the gatekeepers. As the entry point yeah. mm -hmm. to women in politics. And it's a matter of choice. Mm -hmm. um, I want to from that angle, uh, you talked about quality versus quantity. In my research, I found what we call a political path mm -hmm. for women, that the numbers are important. If you have them at the grassroots, then, you know, in mm -hmm. political parties or anywhere, then those large numbers would push for women in leadership positions. And when you have a, a number, a large number of women in leadership and decision-making positions, then these can push their parties to nominate them. And political parties may be uh, given incentives to nominate women, and that's one of the questions that was raised. Uh, some of these incentives uh, uh, range from, uh, you know, uh, uh, giving them a, uh, a break in, uh, in uh, nomination fees. And uh, this is very important because parties sometimes, and this addresses your question too, parties sometimes feel that when they nominate men, they need uh, the women to be 100% perfect, where, whereas men do not need to fit that uh, criteria. Um, that's, that's on the uh, quality versus quantity. I think there are also articles which say that in the UN missions, you know, there is a study that shows that female peacemakers make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. although, although in the UN there are 16 missions, only 69 are military experts. Mm -hmm. 16 missions would have many, many more uh, you know, personnel there. So the UN has a lot to work. Although we started in 1970, uh, you know, giving equal opportunities. So I just wanted to yeah. share this with you. Thank you. Now those are excellent questions. And you? Thank you. Uh, I recall actually the basic, uh, the basic, uh, uh, basic conference. Uh, Secretary that uh, said that uh, Mrs. Albright uh, went to the NGO civil society section uh, in the rain, and uh, in those days there was a separate selection between a governmental, intergovernmental, and civil society forum. And she went to civil society forum, which is very far away from, from the, the, the decision was to be made. And she went there to make a point and talked to uh, Marco Bristol, who was who is a uh, head of the uh, National Council in the Mr. Lee 39, uh, and, and then uh, became the uh, uh, head of the uh, National Council of Disability. And then she said that uh, unless you know, you, 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 you are together, we are not equal. We are, you know, there's no equality, there's no you know, freedom of voice. And um, I thought it was a very important, um, again, contribution to that conference, to the basic conference, because I think when you talk about quality of participation of women, I think, you know, what is a quality? Quality is that woman, uh, woman's participation embraces already diversity. So I just would like to have some uh, views and uh, your experience in promoting uh, women's uh, those disadvantaged women. And so I think... The other question back here will wrap up. Oh, sure. Yes. So I think Akiko's question was that women, the, the term woman is not a monolithic and that women are... Uh, defined by not just their gender, but their class, race, religion, ethnicity, and disability. Um, one of the recurring themes I've noticed today, that pretty much all the panelists have mentioned that one of the major obstacles are patriarchal attitudes and social norms, and what can we do to change those? Great question. I think with that question, I'm going to ask all three panelists to reflect on that and respond to that as our concluding observations. Um, so, to begin with you. Sure. Um, I mean, yes, obviously, 
Yes, I think obviously we've all talked at various panels and discussions about sort of cultural norms and, and the, I mean, it's an overlay in the world in which we live. Um, I want to reflect on a question I think you asked about how do we engage men and, and people who don't necessarily um, share the same hopes that we all have for a cultural norm that's about much more of an egalitarian society, whether it's men and women, all ethnic groups, people of different ages, you know, all the things that we think that if each, we actually believe that each individual should be treated equally and we should listen to their voice equally. All that is a really big challenge. I think what we do is what you're doing every day and what people around the world are doing every day, which is, I, I often think we spend a lot of time in international forums talking about the big picture. And the big picture is really important. And normative change is really important through UN Security Council resolutions, through what we can do at the US government, through what all these other international actors do. It's phenomenally important. But what really makes change every day and changes those norms so that we're having this conversation is what people do in their daily lives. And um, I'm old enough to say that when I was growing up, I did not think in my lifetime we would have an African-American president. That didn't just happen overnight. It happened on, you know, because people all across the country made some big change, some big sacrifice, or some small sacrifice in, in changing the way they thought about social issues, about who could lead, um, people changing the way they think about who can take care of children. That only happens because millions and millions of people change their lives every day in very small ways. And so I'm somebody, I'm obviously an optimist, <laughs> but I'm an optimist because I think small change really, really matters. Because in the long run, it leads to big change. And I think it leads to changes in social norms and it leads to us um, understanding that what we do has an impact not just on ourselves, but on a broader uh, group of people. So. Um, I think it really matters what you do every day. I think others have said that. But thinking about just encouraging other kinds of, if you see somebody or hear about somebody doing something that is a little bit out of the ordinary, ch challenging a norm, whatever it is, I think really supporting that um, and being, being open about why that's important and uh, that you think it's a good thing. So I will close with that. And thank you for doing that in advance and in retrospect, because I'm sure you've already done it already. I'll, I'll comment on your question yes. about um, about Beijing, and I could not agree more. I'll, I'll add that Secretary Clinton went with uh, the then First Lady went with Secretary Albright um, to Wairo, and it was very intentional because they wanted to push the envelope. Right? They didn't want to only speak to the governments; they wanted to speak to the civil society. And you're exactly right that what was there was you know, a manifestation of the fact that women are not a monolith. Mon you know, they're geographically, there's incredible diversity. There's also diversity of race <laughs> and age and ethnicity. And if women didn't work together, and I think what's beautiful about what happened at Wairo and has happened subsequently, but what really happened there in a very um, visible way was the meetings of all of those women who knew what they were doing in their own country or with their own disadvantaged group, but didn't know that there were others working on extremely similar issues around the world. There's actually a great film that's coming out, a documentary called Once and for All, which is about the Beijing conference, and that awful day in the rain is pictured there. Um, it comes out sometime in late November. You should go see it. But I think that that, um, that, that understanding and the role of civil society, um, which really burgeoned at that conference and has made such a difference um, before, obviously, but also after, is, is really important. Thank yeah. you for reminding us about that inspiring moment in history, because that really is what galvanized this. I mean, we are at this point 20 years later because of that moment in history. Yeah, um, yeah and, and, and to complement that, I think also one thing that I've been working now on, you know, gender equality and women's issues for about 12 years, and one thing that uh, I always, that doesn't cease to amaze me, is the diversity of the women's movement, not just in the, the categories that you have listed, but also in the, um, in the amount of issues that are covered by the women's movement. And even look at our discussions today. We've talked about the economy, we've talked about politics, we've talked about the judiciary, we've talked about you know, family life, we've talked about peace, we've talked about war, we've talked, and, 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 and the environment. We haven't talked about it today, but, but that is also a big part of the women's movement. So uh, really this diversity and the fact that it's not a political issue and, it's a, it, and it's an, uh, that gender issues basically are pervasive in everything we do, in, in, in all the small things and the big things we do, I think is, is really important to remember. 
Um, I couldn't say on the behavior change, I couldn't say it better than you have, the small changes of every day. And Rangita, you talked about the 20 years, and I think it's really the small incremental changes, you know, in every people's lives that, that have managed to make a difference. I think it requires changing institutions and policies. We've talked about laws today, and that's uh, extremely important. But it's also about uh, the individual. And here I just want to uh, highlight the importance of engaging men. And I agree with uh, the person who said earlier that it's great to see so many men in the room. Um, and you had two men from you and women today. So that's, and we're not many, so. <laughs> But, um, but I think you, we, we have the he for she campaign, which has really brought a lot of attention to the issue. Um, it's just an, a door. It's just to open a door. It's just to put the issue on men's mind. Because you know, there is in, in the men group that work on gender equality, there is this exercise in one of these behavior change trainings, which is called about looking in the mirror. And the fact that to realize that actually you are a man, that, you ident that, you that this is an aspect of your identity is not always something that men do, whereas <laughs> it's something that often women do. Um, so that's, um, that, I mean, there are lots of trainings and, and, and campaigns to do that. Working with young people, I think, is extremely important. Um, and, and education, starting from the start, starting from the beginning. And finally, also the media. I think uh, we, I've worked in many countries uh, around the world and one of our components with, with both UN Women and UNFPA and one of our components has always been about working with journalists and trying to show them, it's again about looking in the mirror and to show them things that they're not even seeing because they're accepting it as part of mm -hmm. life. So, um, and I, I, I'm also an optimist. Uh, I think that people really, when they see it, they actually want to change it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not so often that people cling to their privilege when they see that it's actually harming others and it's often their loved ones because everybody has, every man has a woman they love somewhere in, 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 near them. So that's... Thank you. And I want to sum up this panel by uh, building off of what you said about the media. I want to share a quote with you from Foreign Policy's David Rothkopf, who looked at his 2013 Foreign Policy's power issue. Every year, Foreign Policy magazine journal puts out a power issue of you know, the greatest leaders of the world of that year. And he bemoaned the fact that less than 3% of those images of power were women. And he wrote, um, he said that the women's, the, the systemic and persistent acceptance of women's second class role is history's greatest shame. So I think Jill's, one of Jill's finest moments was that you said we're not accepting that anymore. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs>